live on stage. That sound. Up Orlando. So, is they ready? Yes. That sound. Up Orlando. You know what is going on, party people? What is going on? You know what time it is. It's time for the so show. Um, I am your boy, Rome, man. We represent Old Town Sound, Orlando, Florida. We're right in the center. You already know what time it is with that. Um, you know, I want to give shouts out to our sponsors of the night. Um, one of our great, great sponsors um, who is designing these very great masks for you to wear. Um, as you can see in the video, shouts out to my main man, George. If you want some fashionable masks that represent your flavor, your style, hit up my man at tomssons.com. He will hook you up um, and you will be looking um, the part of your story. This is what we represent here on the show. It's all about our story, our sound, and our city. Um, so hit up TomSons.com, fresh out of Manhattan, New York. Also, want to give props and to one of our other sponsors. If you need printing or any kind of graphic work, hit my man Jesse Jazz up. Not only is he a local legend, DJing, you know, promoter. Um, can't wait to have you on the show, buddy. So big up to you. But hit my man up, fivestargraphics.com for any of your graphic needs, okay? Now, that we got all of that straight with our sponsors, um, these are one of the shows that I, I truly love. Um, you know, part of, part of the motivation of being able to do this show, and I'm going to keep it 100 with you guys, is to be able to talk to my fellow brothers and sisters um, in a human way in a real way and, and, and be able to, to, to get the conversation that you don't normally get outside of everyone's successes, awards, accolades, you name it. Um, but actually have a real conversation with people that represent, you know, our thing, hip hop culture. And, um, you know, one, I always love having my DJs on because you know, we always, you know, DJs have to have to fight a lot to, to get the credit that they deserve, whether it's producing, whether it's um, inspiring. Uh, we play the back for a reason, but, you know, we we don't always get the credit that we deserve. And so I always look forward to the shows in which we can talk as DJs. You know, DJs play music and some may talk on the mic, but, you know, very rarely you get those conversations where you can actually talk to a DJ and, and get the perspective of how they feel. You know, the music may tell you one thing, but you don't always get that perspective. This is one of those shows in which I'm, I'm truly, truly blessed um, to have uh, my next guest on. But let me give you some context. You know, I'm, I'm, this is 2006. Um, my friend, Ricky, 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 shout out to Ricky, Ricky. He was like, bro, you need to get the Sirius XM. You know, you, you know, you need to really get this, man. They're doing a lot of stuff that terrestrial radio ain't doing. And at that time, you know, like most shit, you know, you're stuck. You know, you're like, man, you know, I'm good with the radio. I don't know why I got to pay for radio. So I I took the leap. They had a free trial going on. I said, you know what? Let me, let me put this on. And so I get to this channel called Hip Hop Nation. And at this time, I mean, there's a lot of people that may know of Hip Hop Nation right now as it is right now. But when it first started out, Hip Hop Nation was playing. Um, their roster was insane. And they had so much diversity in their approach of what they, you know, how they viewed hip hop. And um, he was one of the DJs that I kind of, you know, bucked upon. And I was like, yo. And, you know, like the old days, I wanted to record it. So I want I wound up recording um, a show on Sunday night, and it was called Afro Mentals. And when I tell you this man was playing 
some of the most abstract but fresh hip hop remixes. Um, just it it sounded like the curation before the curation. It sounded like a museum. It sounded like uh, you know some sort of uh, festival. I mean, all wrapped in one in one show. And nothing in which he played had I heard or heard the same anywhere else. Like they were all exclusive to him. And, you know, he's playing Mad Lib, you know, Platinum Pie Pipers, you know, Porter's Head, Apex Twin. Like he was playing all this craziness. And I just couldn't believe it. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm about to move to Kansas City. And once I moved to Kansas City, I mean, I'm literally... I remember the ride to Kansas City. I'm literally playing that back to back. And I, I, it was just one of those mixes, one of those shows in which you never forget. And so I, I just wanted to give you context of who this man is. And he's representing Atlanta GA, straight out of Atlanta. And he's he's done so many things in his career. But I'm going to let him explain some of, the, some of the great things he's done in his career. I want to give it up one time for my man, my brother from another mother representing GA, ATL, DJ Jamar, A for the Afro Mental Show. Give it up to my brother. What's good? What's up, Rome? How you doing? Man. <laughs> I, appreciate that. I, pre I appreciate that intro, man. <laughs> yes, I got, I got you. Know, you ever do something like that for me, you know, I'm, I'm humble. <laughs> yeah, man. I got, I got to give these people context, bro. Context is everything, man. Um, you know, like I said in the in the beginning, um, your show stood out amongst amongst the the trees. It was just, you know, it had its own character. Um, it reminded me of a place I used to go in Orlando uh, called the Social. And shout out to my man DJ BMF. They used to do these things called fat and jazzy. Mm -hmm. And but it was like your style of it. Like if if you had the same spot and, and did it your way, it that's that's what it was to me. Like it had its own flavor. Like you couldn't get that nowhere unless you went to that spot. And it was kind of like taking me to a spot that you know I couldn't get anywhere else. Nobody's nobody was playing like you. Um, but before we get into what what I'm talking about, um, tell everybody, you know, how do you get into um, hip hop and gravitate towards DJ? What 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 led you to that road? So I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, the Lehigh Valley. Um, it's basically situated. It's about 20 minutes from uh, the New Jersey border. It's kind of like about maybe I say about half an hour from the Poconos, 45 minutes from Philadelphia, an hour, 15 minutes from New York City. Oh, so, wow. So basically, I grew up listening to Red Alert, Chuck Chill Out, uh, WKTU 92, uh, College Radio, Lehigh. Le um, Lehigh University had uh, basically like a college radio station that they played a lot of. Um, you know, the electro hip hop and stuff like that of the 80s. Um, so I was basically groomed by the radio. You know, right. radio really, uh, you had Philly, Power 99, uh, WDAS, in New York, you had uh, WBLS and Kiss FM. Um, so you had all these influences around you, uh, lots of diversity when it came to the culture and the people that lived in the Lehigh Valley area. And of course, when you went to New York, that was just like fertile ground right there. Like you're in a heart of it. Every time we would go shopping and stuff like that in New York City for records, or we would go to Philly to get the records. So um, Allentown was a good place um, because it was, it was basically the suburbs of those metropolitan areas. So- right. It was still like a little, a small town, industrial, you know, where Bethlehem Steel was still in operation. That was there. The so people, really, you know, came up that way to get opportunity. That's where my family's originally from North Carolina and um, Southern Pines area. It's about 25 miles from Fayetteville. But my grandmother moved up there, you know, basically to help, you know, to raise her children 
you know. So I grew up in it, man. I grew up 18 years of my life uh, before I moved to Atlanta when I was 18. When I graduated high school, I moved to Atlanta. But that region basically helped to basically hone or develop, cultivate my awareness for music. Shout out, shout out to Philly. Because yeah. Philly, for some damn reason, I don't know if it's the Scrapple. I don't know. Yeah. Shout out to Red Market. Like for some, like that's one of my favorite places on the planet. You yeah, take me to yeah. Reading Market, I'm 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 in paradise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but for some reason, Philly just continues to nonstop produce these, you know, measures, if you will, of black excellence of just uh, of the rebellion of not being. Maybe it's just the rebellion of not being from New York. Like you it, know that it, like, it is, it is. It's, uh, that rocky that rocky about it. Like you know everybody's you know Rocky Balboa. Like man, you know fuck Apollo Creed. Like you know or <laughs> or, or, or fuck Mr. T. Um, you know like we we got this. You yeah. know, and it's just that heart that that energy that comes out of Pennsylvania in general. Like it's it's so it's so amazing to watch. Um, you know, from DJs, Cash Money, shout out to Tap Money. I'm gonna have him on tomorrow. You oh, know, cool. yeah. Um, shout out to you know the Roots. You know, like just just the level, the excellence that has come. Jazzy Jeff. Uh, I mean, the list goes on of you know, and to come from that cloth, you know, uh, that explains a lot. Um, and what was it like leaving Philly? or leaving Pennsylvania and coming to um, the Peach State, you know, so, and- so It was a culture yeah. shock. It was a culture yeah. shock. Um, the bright side was the weather. It was a lot warmer. Um, I feel like the economy was, you know, it was a lot easier as far as affordable living. Right. Uh, um, the thing I disliked was the transit system was hard. It's horrible still. You had yeah. to drive everywhere, and then it was real clickish because you couldn't really walk down the street. You couldn't meet people. Now you have where people are, you know, walking stuff more. Right. Um, it's more social. Uh, you know, you have more of a cross pollination going on with people meeting each other. But but back in '87 when I moved to Atlanta, it was really very isolated. So it didn't really and that's crazy much. because. Um, I had MC Shy D on, and shout out to MC Shy D. He 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 kind of explained the opposite. He said when he got down there, people were more friendly. Uh, he was coming from the Bronx, and uh, similar to around the time period that you're talking about. And um, he said people were more friendly, um, kind of you know, they they would approach you. Um, he said now it's it's kind of different in that regard it's and and it's 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 weird and awesome how atlanta has those stories um well i think what it is you have basically like i would consider like different areas in town as boroughs just like you have uh bankhead you have southwest atlanta um you have decatur you have basically like different boroughs where it's a different type of dialect being spoken uh, different type of vibes, you know, and there's also different types of groups that are living in certain areas too. Like Stone right. Mountain is heavily uh, like African and Caribbean. Uh, right. You got the North side now, which is heavily populated with Indians. Um, uh, you have um, uh, Gwinnett, which is uh, mostly like Asian community. Uh, Beaver Highway and, and kind of like inside like Brookhaven and stuff like that. There's a lot of Mexicans that live. Right. Uh, so, and and that's well, that's kind of like an international kind of like road, um, right. like, and all the way out to the to Gwinnett, you basically have like, you know, a kind of like a it's a diverse group of people, basically uh, immigrants that come to Atlanta. So, I right. feel like um, still segregated, still very segregated, you know, but 
it's real clickish, man, because you really basically just get in where you fit in. And when it comes to the sound and music and what I'm used to hearing when it comes to coming from the north, there's a certain type of people that will basically gravitate towards that sound. Right. So I can't go out to, you know, outside of Atlanta, say Southwest Atlanta, and be like, oh, let me play all this New York music. Because then they're gonna, like, oh, you from New York or, or from PA and all that. It's like, you know, then there's just this kind of like prejudice towards that, you know. <laughs> right. Well, uh, to be fair, I know that story of the South well. And that story of the South is for a lot of people growing up in the South, it was, it seemed like the thing to do to come down from New York or up North and, you know, slowly but surely kind of have that superiority complex or that, you know, feeling like the people down South were dumb if they didn't if they weren't up on what was going on um, with music. And for a lot of people, and I think that is a generational thing too, because for a lot of people, that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, at first, a lot of people did accept it. And there was a generation of people that were like, man, why are you acting like you're from New York, man? You you, you, you grew up down the street. What the hell you had like, you know, why are you listening to all that? Like, our shit ain't better. I mean, or like, our shit ain't good. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that a lot for a lot of people mm -hmm. that it, it made people feel like, yeah, we, we don't got the rock hymns. We don't have the, the big daddy canes. Um, but we ain't, we ain't whack. Like we like this shit, you know, like we like that slow down drag stuff. So I know it was going on in Florida heavy and all the stories I've ever heard about Atlanta was similar. I heard New York, had a run in Atlanta for a long period of time until they changed that dynamic. Um, well, it's also, uh, it's also, I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a climate difference is because mm -hmm. you only have a certain amount of hot months in Pennsylvania. Right. Where you go swimming, you go to the beach and then right. you go to school and it's cold again. So right. you might have four, four and a half, warm months but with atlanta it's it's way you know the climate is way different so the way everything moves down here is different the whole the food is you know eating you know it's like i i came down here was eating chicken biscuits i go back up north I'm like can i get chicken biscuits like we don't have that up here <laughs> I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm like, what you know? I'm like, no. oh, i forgot where i'm at so yeah so the thing is, it, it, it does have a lot to do with the conditions there, the environments that are, you know, right. spread out more here, where up north is more dense, densely populated because of the industrial, you know, complex or, you know, the industries were close to, you know, the homes were built close to those factories. People would walk right. to the factories. It was really structured in a way where it's like on a grid. Atlanta's got a different type of, you know, grid system here. It's kind of like just being implement it now more like a, a bigger city but it's because it's a young city so eventually yeah. as it gets more crowded and they grow it probably will be more like a like like a you know like a philly or new york and stuff like that you know like right. North well, uh, right now atlanta is the wakanda of the united states because you know they're they're definitely pulling a lot of uh you know rabbits out of the hat to change the dynamics in our politics in which yeah which has to be celebrated um, for what all they've been able to accomplish in such a red state. I mean, it's still red to me. The, uh, the blue is the vote. That's the only thing I say that is blue about this state. You are actually correct. <laughs> you are actually That's the only thing that was blue, the vote. Uh, I, outside of that, boy, that thing is about as red as a goddamn Yeah, boy. we don't have to talk much about that. I don't, I don't want to get too caught in politics because you know what people, they don't really see what I see because I'm in the street all the time. So right. I'm on the ground level. So I see things and I travel all around the city. So right. I well, let's, cool. let's continue that journey. You get to Atlanta. It, it becomes a culture shock. Talk about how you started implementing the music aspect to your life once you're in Atlanta. 
So what happened was I moved to Atlanta and I decided to go in the military. So um, I bought my first set of turntables, I'd say, as I was graduating high school, that was 1987. So I came down here and all I did was practice. So I used to buy my records from Pennsylvania, have them shipped, New York, wherever, I would have them shipped. So, because it was hard to find stuff down here. So right. when the military, um, I was stationed in Missouri, so I would drive to Kansas City. They had a couple of record stores there. I would go there, but I always, always had music delivered to me. So I basically practiced. My formula was basically, I loved hip hop. You can call it underground, independent, whatever, but it was true school. The Rock Hymns, the Karis Ones, you know, MC Shan, you know, you name it. Uh, right. Basically, I'm basically like a true school. Right. Kind of because it's all about it's all about the knowledge. It's all about uh, right. expansion, the growth, self development. You know, I'm all into those things. But I'm also yep. into music. I love sound. You know, I love how the things are arranged and composed, and they come together. And then the voice, when it comes in, it's just like it's like the icing on the cake. Right. Right. That's what I when I hear good music. That's it gives me chill bones. So the main thing is. That's what I would do as a DJ. I'm like, I want to encapsulate all these different genres of music, mix them together, and just set a vibe, create a vibe, the ambiance for, for the ears. When I started doing clubs and parties in Kansas City, of course, that's when the gangster rap came in. That would be like 1990. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. You was in Kansas City, my brother? I was at White Man Air Force Base. Oh man! Shout out to the Show Me State. Yeah. Show Me. Yeah, I know exactly where that's at. I used the to drive MSU was right down the street. And yeah. we were going to CMSU to do the parties. You know, I get yeah. high to some parties. But you know, back then you had some raggedy equipment. You had to bring the amp. You had to bring all the speakers. You had to bring the light. You had to bring all this stuff in your car, and it was like. A ratchet fest, you know what I mean? You know, I try to play like rock king on it, like man, we don't want to hear none of that. Mm -mm. It was MC Breed, you know. I had to play MC Breed, Breed. Tech Nine, yeah, all that kind of stuff. It's like yeah. oh, it's just too short, you know. Yep. It was it was really more leaning towards the West Coast, and that's what Kansas City was to Missouri. It was the Oakland of yeah, yeah. Missouri. Yeah. Um, and St. Louis, Louis was more kind of like the Chicago of Missouri. Like they they represent two different coasts. Yeah, um, both of those cities. But continue, so, my brother. So everything basically from that was like, well, I don't want to be forced to play things that I don't really be vibing with like that. You know, I was really always the person that was, hey, my daughter was born when I was 19. So that kind of like reinforced my value system where it's like, hey, I don't want my daughter uh, hearing this kind of music. I don't want her to be like, you know, talking about bitch better have my money, <laughs> you know, AMG. Shout out to AMG, man. Like, yeah. On that song, you know, when I'm at the club, you know, you had to have a balance, you know? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so to me, they taught me, okay, I, got to find a way to play mm -hmm. music that I love, that I grew up on, but keep a, a, a balance with playing what they want to hear. Right. Then fast forward, we then I, I went to Germany. So Germany, um, I worked with this, uh, this club promoter, and he had me go to all these different clubs all over Germany, different bases. So every weekend, I would DJ at all these different clubs. And what I would do is formulate a balance between playing the Daz effects and, you know, uh, all the kind of like underground stuff, but also playing the stuff that people wanted to hear. Right. So it was a beautiful thing is because I was able to play what I wanted to play like early in the night. I would switch off with other DJs and then we would, you know, we would do the run in our sets where we play. 
we go to New York, then we go to California, then we go to Atlanta. So it worked because you right. basically would be able because it was a diverse group of people because people were from all over the place. And what you're describing, and I'm gonna stop you there. What, what you what you're describing, and shout out to all my DJs that are tuning in right now that can understand what I'm saying. You were playing the music in context. Um, mm -hmm. Anything without context, it's a difficult pill to swallow for anybody. Even even if it's your most hardcore hip hop person. Um, you need to have a balance in that mix. You need to have some contrast of colors. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I don't get when I hear people say, I only listen to this. Like, mm -hmm. really? That sucks. Like, how can, can you play you something I can dance to? Or can you play something up tempo? Like, right. Trap music is not up tempo, it's double time, it's, it's, it's slicing in half. Right. But to only <laughs> listen to that, yeah. to only yeah. listen to that. Only listen to that is like, you know. Like, come on, man. I mean, like, because what you're describing a lot, too, uh, uh, those um, those eras, that time, a lot of stuff was coming out. Like, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have the YouTubes. And, you know, so we depended on our radio and our DJs to show us new records that we might not even be up on, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that was everything. Um, talk about. Like you said, um, you're doing this, you, you, you're giving love to every sect. Now talk about how you came back to the States and, you know, talk about that transition when you came so back. When I came back to the States, it was a rude awakening. It's because I realized that I wasn't established in the, you know, the communities that were like terrestrial radio, um, you know, I didn't have connections with celebrities yeah. um, because I was in the military five years. So when right. I got out, I'm like, well, I'm going to do weddings. It's because I did weddings in the military. I already had all the equipment that I needed. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to just, you know, blaze my own trail. But I got um, the wedding. It was, it was like I was just doing it for money. It was It was killing my spirit. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start volunteering and I'm going to go to some clubs and I'm going to, hey, let me spin here. Let me show you what I can do. If you like me, then you can hire me. So it was this place in Buckhead. It was called Carnival. Uh, it was like a little ratchet spot, man, but it was it was jumping. It was a pretty, it was a nice spot. It was it was a nice mixture of people. And, um, but um, at the time, uh, my roommate Donovan, uh, he, he was going to school as a chiropractor, right? So I had taught him how to DJ. So he was Jamaican. So, of course, with me and him, he would do the reggae. So I was really big in reggae at that time. So we would DJ on this patio. And basically, we have an open mic. And once people started coming, MCs would come. You know, you'd have some dudes that were, you know, Jamaican, you know, Caribbean culture would come up in there. And we were just turning into a live party, man. And then, wow. while, then I started doing my mixtapes. So I would always do mixtapes, right? I would always do them for myself in the military. So once people got them, you know, I would make duplicates, you know, and I would spread them that way. But then once I got back, that's when I started really getting more serious about doing CDs, mix CDs. So. From there, what happened is I, I, I used to go to the bootlegger in town. I found, I, you know, I kind of stumbled across the place. And then I said, hey, you know, would you buy my masters? You know, and then I would sell them the masters. And before you know it, things started circulating around the city. Wow. So it was really always me finding a way. Like, if I don't have to do what everybody else is doing. I'm going to find a way to do it and get my name out here on my own, but still maintain the integrity, you right. know, my values for music. And, and was this the first, um, was this the first inclination or the first uh, addition of what would be eventually Afro Metals? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, so Continue. I, I initially um, did a, a a mix before. Basically, I bought my house in two thousand, and when I moved into the house, I came home one day. I started writing down some names on paper, and then I saw a picture of my mother and I. She had like you know a short afro, and I had like real curly hair, big hair. And I was like, man, there's got to be something because I, you know, I was always into the '70s style with the bell bottoms and stuff like that. I always thought it was real cool. So I was like, man, I'm gonna do a soul mix, and I started writing down some things on paper. And I'm like, well, Afro mental, that's that seems cool. And um, I put it out a little bit of bootlegger. It started certain circulating and then people are like when's the next one coming out so what i would do is i would do these mixtapes too i'll do five and two and three i'd release them at the same time and four and five six and seven you know because it was like uh at the time drama i wasn't in there i wasn't associated with the film i wasn't with that dj crew yet but me and him ran the same circles for people that we knew Shout out to DJ Drama. Yeah, so yeah. DJ Drama, basically, we would all kind of like go to this spot called Fat Beats. Fat Beats was in Atlanta once upon a time. Once upon a time. Shout out to Fat Beats, bro. It was in New York, of course, you know, in Manhattan. Yeah. And then they had a, they basically had a, a store in Atlanta on Mitchell Street, and it was managed by Cognito, um, who was a person that uh, helped me in a lot of ways to get mixtape started. Cause he's like, Hey, I was like, Hey, how do I get the mix in the store? He's like, well, you know, this kind of vibe, these are the DJs we have, you know, go get you some artwork and his roommate, H graphics, H2O of the group, you know, they were in a group called mass influence. They basically a rap group, him tone and mass, um, Cognito tone and H they were mass influence. And also, um, X was a DJ too. So they had all the connections. So I'm like, well, let me follow this formula, do the things I need to do to get the, get the artwork, put a mix in the store so I can start doing stuff on consignment, start selling mixtapes. So I wanted to be like the DJ Craig G and Kid Capri, and, but I wanted to do it for like soul hip hop. So I'm like, right. so, and of course, drama was already doing that. Drama was already doing uh, the mixes um, it was called automatic relaxation. So that's why I was like, well, he's got automatic relaxation and I'll just do something called aphromels, you know? Right. That'd be my thing. So, so talk about how that, how that translated into getting a spot at the very beginnings of Sirius XM. Uh, well, at that point, it was serious. So that's drama gets the credit for that is because basically when we were doing mixes and I started circulating them on the street through the method I told you, through the uh, the bootleggers, once right. I started to get on the street, because because drama used to set up at, um, I guess, at the AU, because they went to the AU, uh, they went to Clark. I don't know which ones went to Clark or Morris Brown, or, but they AU uh, Landon University would have like uh, I guess they have like a what do you call it like a little marketplace where he would right. sell, and sell mixes and stuff like that. Right for all the college kids, and that's right. how he would get the gangster grills out there. Yeah, so it was a thing where hey, they saw what I was doing. I was getting the artwork done and. And I was also putting stuff out repeat, repeatedly, and I put stuff in the record stores. So they approached me and said, hey, man, you know, we want you to be down with us and what we're doing. And uh, once I joined them, uh, they leveraged uh, a position for me on series, a show. So they said, you want to do this show on series? I said, of course. So I jumped on it. I have no radio experience. I, well, I was doing... I was doing my mixes, but I was working with uh, Lorenzo Caldwell. He does uh, B BDS uh, Media Base. Right. Uh, um, his name is LC, um, MOC Radio. So I was doing MOC Radio first. Yeah. Then I went to Sirius from MOC Radio to Sirius XM. 
Well, it was serious at the time. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, right. it was just serious, right? Yeah, right. It was. Uh, it, was um, it wasn't hip hop nation first. It was serious. It was forty two. It was channel forty two. Um, hip hop nation, and it went to serious forty. So um, big shout going out to serious Ron Mills. You know, because he was the one that would basically upload all my mixes, had all that patience all those years, man. I would be right. late, you know, because I also worked in the dental field. So the things that I did in the military, I basically, I still was basically like, uh, I would say I was moonlighting as a, a dental assistant because the DJing thing, my whole house was records, music. That I would live that. I would set my schedule around making those mixtapes. Right. I go to work, come home, take a nap, get up, mix. Go back to sleep, get up, mix. Go to work, do the same thing. Go DJ at the club, get ideas, make my money, come home, sleep, and repeat it. That's all I did for 11 years. I did that for 11 years straight. The life of a DJ. If you if you don't know what a DJ going through, man, he just he gave me the blueprint right there. Yeah. Um, and it very very anything else. That's the way it is now. I mean, I, I, I you know I guess I can credit the military for well also my upbringing. You know because we had a pretty structured you know house home in which you know I would have to clean at I, I had chores uh i had to do my studies uh, my mom even put up with that music me practicing stuff like that for years you know i gotta give her a shout out her and my stepdad you know putting up with all that music that loud noise me practicing yeah so um yeah that's, that's just all it is it's uh diligence when you have this diligence and you rehearse and you practice and you practice 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 you just become better and better, better at it. Especially you, uh, when you're, you know about DJing, you got to be able to improvise. So if you have a, a problem, you got to be able to solve it. You got to right. be, careful, you know, you got to, you got to be able to, hey, keep you cool, even though people don't, you know, hey, I messed up just now, but you just throw on another record and it's, you know, you don't miss a beat. Well, in finding, finding, that's why post, I mean, pre digital, it was that much more harder um, or more expensive to have those records on the fluff. Meaning, to your point, yeah, you made mistakes, but deliberateness is a virtue in DJing. Mm -hmm. If it sounds like you're deliberately doing that, there's no mistake involved. Like everyone, damn, he cut that like that, or he just dropped that in. Like it, you know, it wasn't um, always about like what I love about DJs. And shout out to all my DJs that experiment and 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 think and draw outside the lines. Is that um, and I, and I credit some of the things I heard you do. Um, it wasn't traditional in the sense of. Yeah, you're a DJ, but what you were doing was painting a live picture in real time with music. So it didn't have necessarily, okay, I'm going to mix this, I'm going to go into this yeah. and do this and do it, rinse, repeat. There, there was, was a bit of preparation, a little bit right. of preparation because those were the songs that I would find. So say you got like, a rock him song and i knew it was an al green sample okay i'm gonna make sure i have these i'm gonna put these in this folder and have them ready right the rest of it the two hours of that show i did it was all vibe freestyle improv right it was all right. improv yeah so so the thing is uh you cultivate a ear right for what it over is time. That you do. yeah over time when you practice now you have the skill you're able to translate and create this paint this picture for right. the people who are dancing or listening so of course you know you always got records that you know hey the crowd's not feeling this let me go to this popular tune and i know that'll get them on back on the floor 
you're already gonna have those things, those those uh, backups. You know what I mean? Um, but I, one of the great things about the radio that sometimes is unappreciative. I mean, we had we had the luxury of growing up in that radio world, where you know you listened to you know Friday night, Saturday night. Mm. Sometimes Sunday night, mix whoever show. was on, mix show. and you got to hear a show, mm -hmm. which is like different than you DJing at a club. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff that you put together was a variety show, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will. Mm -hmm. it, it was your own version of, you know, maybe the Jackson Five show. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the movie. You had, they're, they're, they're movies. They're right, right, DJ. right. Because when you hear a red alert DJ, you hear all these drops come in where people are shouting them out, artists right. are shouting them out. It's just like with the way it's structured, it's like it's it's really it's stimulating. Yes, it's yes, I, and mm -hmm. I miss that. Yeah, I, miss um, that. I like to feel that I do that with my own radio show, um, because yeah, you can most. It's almost people think that um, your hip hop DJ or every DJ is hating on other DJs. I actually enjoy that DJs play other stuff because that allows me to play what I'm going to play. Yes, and right. it's not going to be what they're playing. That's and it. I feel like I'm in a space where I could just be free and not be pressured because like you said, the club nights um, and every DJ has gone through this. You go into the club, no matter where you're, where you're at in the rotation, you're <laughs> like, man, don't play that motherfucking record, bro. I was going to play that fucking record. And then you're, you're playing to avoid not playing their record or vice versa. And it's just like, you know, the show is like, like, like you said, it's a movie. It's a, it's a TV show. It's a Netflix you know what helped me, that's funny that you point that out. You know what helped me improve is because I used to have this one DJ I used to spin with, and he would like to hog the crowd. So you know there's like a peak time, like say you know the club's gonna close at two or three o'clock. Right. Everyone comes in around eleven forty-five. Right. It's to get crowded. Then it's easier to play the records, is because now all you have to do is drop them is because you have the you have the audience you have the attendance there so he would play he would run through all the hit records so right. like, he was running through all the hit records now i got to be creative so you know what that's when i would get good at other genres i'm like right oh, now right. okay i know the reggae stuff so now i'm going to kill him with the reggae right then i knew the house so i'm like I'm going to kill them on the house because they ain't going to know. And then I would also have samples. So then that's when I would drop the samples of the, the hot music. And they're like, wait, this sounds familiar. What? Oh, now, now you got, now you got the shock value. So I'm like, okay, you might be good because you're dropping all the hit records. Right. That's usually the formula of the radio DJs. I'm not a radio DJ. Right. I hate you just play on the I, I hate, hate drop a record. I hate I hate being a jukebox. I don't like it. I just DJed at uh this place called Rock Steady. Really dope spot this weekend on Saturday in Atlanta. Very dope spot. Anyone that comes to Atlanta, I recommend you visit the place. It's got the ambiance. I haven't had the food yet, but they got vegan options, gluten free, all that. But I actually felt when I went back in there, I was like, man, this place got the magic. And when I went in there and played, initially I played some of my remixes and somebody approached me and was like, hey, can you play something more upbeat? I'm like, I realized that, Jamal, you're spoiled. It's because you, had, you haven't been in the clubs for like three or four years. I've been only doing places where nobody requests music. Nobody comes up and asks for a shout out, birthday shout out. So I got spoiled, man. But I really, <laughs> what came back to me is my skill. I'm like, oh, I got to play for the crowd again. It came back like it was nothing, you know. Right. 
but I had to warm up because you know I wasn't used to the turntables. They have like the newer techniques that have the pitch up and pitch down. Right, right. They're real sensitive. They're real sensitive. Right. And then they had an S9. I use a Rain 72. I don't like the S9. That's why I bought the 72s because I like everything, all the gains and the EQ to be all on one line. Where the S9 is to the right, where the gain is. I don't like that. So I, I, I shout out to all my Rain heads because I still. I paid two grand for my Rain 64, and I don't care if they come out with the S20. I ain't trading that damn thing for nothing. Rain's a superior, man. They're, they're right, man. I love my Rain. I love that fader. Um, and like you said, it you you know, that's part of the uniqueness or the character of being a DJ. Simple yeah. shit like that. Yeah. Like Everybody goes out and buys the same fucking mixer. I get it with the turntables. Yeah. You win on that one. Yeah. I'm not going to argue techniques. We're buying techniques all together. I agree. I yeah. got you. Yeah. But now we're talking about mixers, and I got to buy your needles. Man, fuck all that. Like, I want to buy my shit. Like, when yeah. do I become me in this equation? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when do I do what I'm going to do in this equation? I think that's the beauty of everything is because, you know, you have people that will customize their turntables, put the lights yeah, on. Yeah, that's me. I, you, I'm, I'm guilty of that. You got the different skins and, you know, yeah. you have different types of needles with the autophones or the shores or the stands. Uh, you got yeah, I'm still on the shores, man. I'm still you got on the, the You got the controller DJs. You got the CDJs. You got the turntables. You got you can use the rain controllers. It's, nowadays, it's just – I love it is because now even so – more so, I like uh, women being more a part of the, the, the culture, whereas before they were overshadowed. Um, that has definitely helped. I think that's helped with the music scene overall yeah. is because they bring a different uh, experience when, when it comes to DJing. Uh, it's, it's a great look. Yeah. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I love my brothers out there, man. But anytime you get a, a beautiful woman that knows how to use them turntables, oh I yeah, mean, like, you know, like, technical, like you know, you had Coco Chanel back in the day. Yeah, man. Was, uh, what what show was that? Was that a uh, Teen Summit? I don't know if it was Teen Summit or. Uh, You're probably right. It was Teen Summit. Damn. Yeah. I remember. Damn. I think I remember seeing her first. And I'm like, and I heard her. Like doing these scratches and sounds like Jazzy Jeff style and flares and stuff. Like, yo, who is that? Right. I was blown away. I was like, oh man, I love her. <laughs> like, I, I think that's amazing. I think it's beautiful. I think it's dope that you know, like like I said, it, this culture, though it doesn't it doesn't seem like that from the surface. It is welcoming, yeah. um, you know. And people, you know, especially when it comes to DJs, you always gotta love. When women say, you know what, man, I could do this. Shout out to Rob Swift. I have Rob Swift on and um, Dilly Rowe. And um, yeah, she's an up and coming DJ. And, you know, it's just great when you see females take on that role because they, they're taking on the rapping, obviously, you know. Um, but we definitely we definitely need some more female DJs who 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 are fundamentally sound, too. Who know about the turntables? Um, hey, there's, a lot, there's a lot of really good DJs in Atlanta, man. Yeah, on DJ Hourglass, DJ Natural. Um, there's a lot of really good DJs here, um, and especially alternative in alternative sound. You know, being able to play the soul, hip hop, the well rounded. Right. So I think I think I think with the technology and the access with you know places like you know Instagram Live, Twitch, Mixcloud, right? It's it's definitely has changed everything, man. Everything has basically evolved over the years. Um, so basically, with me, it's kind of like um, it's like I just fell right in, you know. Right. I didn't really have to chase anything. I basically blazed a trail based on what I believed in. Yeah. What's some what's some of the what's some of the screwiest I'm using a, a funny word. What's some of the what's some of the illest shit you know that you've seen in the DJ world that made you kind of to your point 
um, run for your morality, if you will? What what were some of the things that kind of made you feel like, yeah, I love this, but I'm you ain't going to get me to do this. What what are some of those things that uh, that you as a DJ faced? Well, let's go back to serious. It's because at one point, when they brought Howard Stern in, and I'm sure they were making cuts, budget cuts, they gave everyone an option. Like, hey. Um, if and that's you, when they did the merger, correct? Yeah, if you want to do your show, you know, we're not going to be able to pay you. So they stopped paying me. I did it for free. Wow. So what people don't know is that I had to hustle and I had to basically create ways to, you know, create revenue streams from doing that show. Now, technically, now, technically, mm -hmm. that's the equivalent of a worldwide billboard. Yeah. Um, it's not like local radio. You're actually playing for the world, whoever's listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there may be a lot of DJs that would have done that for free. You know, well, just you, well, you you have to know that if you're gonna do anything to not be bought, right? You you know, once you once you kind of like make these agreements, you go in these contracts, you gotta honor your word. You gotta honor right. the agreement. Right. So that's why for me. It's like, well, that's an agreement that I can make because I already love this. Right. So, right. and I don't want to disappoint the people that are already listening and following. So it was right. like, oh, well, this is a, a great opportunity for me to broaden my, you know, uh, you know, my, my supporters, you know, my, my fan base. And uh, also, oh, I had so many things in the works. I was working, I was working with Tasteful Licks. It was a record label, you know, based out of uh, Raleigh. And, um, you know, I was just over Shout out to North Carolina, home of Night Wonder. I was already, I was just connected to so many people, man. So I'm like, you know, hey, this, this is, I'm just going to use this, even with the radio now, 107.5 with Magic. You know, it's, you just got to use your relationships, you know, to leverage, you know, and get to where you want to go in this world. It's like, like you got Nipsey Hustle, man. It's, it's a marathon. You know right, I mean? and all, marketing until you leave here. It's a marathon until you die. <laughs> yeah, and marketing is is probably one of the most expensive, uh, disposable um, uses of money in pretty much in any industry. Like at least with food, before they throw it out, people have eaten. That's right. But marketing. You could spend a million dollars in marketing and nobody nobody improves it, nobody goes for it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's one of those things in which, to your point, radio, terrestrial, satellite, any forms of media where you could showcase your skills and you didn't spend any money to do it is actually an intelligent move. Because for a lot of people, that is a that is a bottomless pit. Your it's all about the connection. Yeah, it's all about the connection. You got to form a connection with people. Uh, there has to be some type of con uh, attachment right. that you have, whatever you're doing. So it's like when people, because uh, then people will follow you. Right. So they'll follow you wherever you go. So right. once I left Sirius, once the merger and they started basically cutting out all the different, you know underground shows the old school shows and then they started doing more of the you know the trap you know type of well, you say like it is it's commercial stuff yeah commercial yeah. music they want what they what what they would go based on whatever the protocol or agenda whatever their you know whatever their their plans were they went further on to that because it's all about advertising you know what i mean right and it's mergers always always exactly. leave people out yeah, you got to get subscribers. You know, order for you to get subscribers, you know, you basically got to appeal to the marketplace. The only problem I like to tell people is like, hey, you know, if you want more of what you want out here, you got to support it. And you got to support it with your money. You know, it can't just be like you uh, trying to get in free, 
you know, people always trying to hit me to get in free. You got to support. So if you know I'm somewhere, show up. Show up whether you got to pay to get in or whatever it is. And make sure you know, hey, I'm here to see DJ Jamal. It's like, you know, whoever it is, if they're playing your music, you got to show up. You know, especially like locally, you know. Right. You, know, you it's many times where if you're from if I'm from Atlanta and Quest Love comes to DJ, of course he's gonna get he's the headline. He's world world renowned, you know, he's big. He's on a bigger platform than me. Of course he's gonna get the big bucks, but I have to go overseas to get that kind of money. I gotta travel, you know, hours upon hours, you know, to, to get you know, to get, you know, the the three K you know, to go spin at that club, you know. Right. But unfortunately, that's just the way the game works is because it's all about the draw, you know. It's all about what, what are some of the What are some of the things that, um, you know, because like I said, I described some of the music that you played, and I know I can't describe it because to me, I know I ain't giving it justice. But you had you've had exclusive stuff, remixes, um, Locksmith. Um, what's those guys out of Spain? Cooking Soul. Cooking Soul. Yeah, it's one producer. It's a producer that you're Cooking Soul. Cooking Soul. The stuff that he was remixing. I mean, like to have all that inclusive stuff. So. I mean, me and, Don Cannon, apart, dude. me and Don Cannon. Don Cannon uh, put me on the cooking soul. Really? Shout out to Cannon. 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 Don Cannon. Cannon. Me and Don Cannon. So Don Cannon is basically the affiliates are all true school DJs. Yeah, I know. They're all and, true school DJs. And, and they're doing what they're doing with the Gangster Grill stuff as any other DJ would, which is relate to the kids you know relate that's all it was they brought they brought the northern mixtape game right off that wasn't really structured they right. had a whole dj clue uh you know type of uh, uh approach to doing releasing the southern music basically right that wasn't that wasn't happening here they well yeah dj jelly he was doing it um and some other, I, I forget the name, uh, Oomp Camp. Um, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not that really familiar with all the different cliques, man. Because Yeah, but. but I'll, be own, I'll be on my own thing. I, I'm not the but drama, like No, but Drama, he, he took one for the team. Yeah, he automated yeah. things. Right. He automated yeah. things. That, and he took one for the team. Like, he, he was behind. Some of the stuff that you know the feds was after when they try to lock down for copyright and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you know, he put himself on the front line where a lot of DJs prior to him and then even after him didn't have to deal with any of that. He yeah. had, had it locked so long and so big, you know, it brought the attention of the government. Um, you know, you're doing big things, you wasn't even, it wasn't even about no dope. Like you, we talking about music, man. Yeah, the yeah. government. Well, music, know, music, music is a form of. Uh, no, it is dope. <laughs> it, it is a dopamine. Right. You know, that's why we call it dope. Yeah, that's why we call it dope. They're not chasing us for the for the damn for for a cassette tape. But what yeah. you have with Don Cannon? Don Cannon was basically a producer, so. Now what I'll tell people is that's how that's where the uh, Gene Brown was the record collector that I would purchase music from from North Carolina. He was from Charlotte, so he knew Gene Brown knew all the producers all over the country. Right. So he would travel to them to sell records because me and him would ride. You know, say we go to Philly and he meet up with we meet up with Rich Medina and then. He go to New York and bounce around. I go stay with my family, and then he go bounce around, go see Just Blaze or Lord Finesse or whatever clients he's dealing with to sell records. Wow. So Don Cannon bought many records from Gene Brown. Gene Brown's legendary still to this day. 
Yeah. Um, because he knows he's the one that sells these records that you're hearing. He's the one that even turned these people on to these records that they're even sampling for these songs. So you hear that? You hear that? If you're talking about Atlanta, if you're talking about the record game, yeah. shout out to the cannon, the cannon, the yeah. cannon. Yeah. So cannon. So cannon, me and him will swap records, or we always so me, uh cannon, uh no ID. We'd be in the studio just hanging out. Um, they're going back and forth, playing beats, making beats, stuff like that. So I would be hanging out more. So with Cannon, um, drama was more on the mainstream tip. So because I was more in the underground, I would hang more. I would I would be more around Cannon. So then um, you got a thing where um, uh, what were we initially talking about? I just lost you're about, you're just uh, to bring everybody back we're talking about the, the uh, soul aspect the soul aspect right so basically why that translated is because when i was on Sirius, when we're playing commercial music stuff that they would suggest that we play okay I would have to remix that stuff. So if it was right, remix, okay, 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 okay. No, no, no. You stop right damn there. You stop right damn there. Because we have rotations. We have rotations. They were suggesting records because yes. if yes. I listen to your yes. show yes. for five yes. minutes, I don't hear the suggestions. I hear this is coming out of your brain. There's no way in hell they're suggesting Apex Twin. You're playing X. No, we're no, not, we're not suggesting to play that. They're suggesting right. like the top forty. Gotcha. Okay. You know, we want to, we want, we want to create continuity. So, you know, there's a hot record by Common. There's a hot record by Lil Boozy. There's a hot record by The Game. There's a hot right. record by you know Kanye. We're, we're you know all no, Northwest, East, South. Right. You know? So, if but it's you would not play the real version of my sound defined sounds of Afrimentals, then I remixed it into the format. Right. So this is where you would start getting me being more creative in remixing as far as the production. So was this a DJ remix or this was a production remix? This would be me. Well it wasn't like it wasn't I wasn't getting paid for it. No, I mean I I'm meaning like you had an acapella. Did you I make play acapella and then basically I remix it myself to fit my format. So that's where you would get me mixing uh uh what is that lean with it rock with it who is that uh that's uh damn it franchise franchise, uh, Fran franchise. franchise. yeah so then I would mix that with James Ingram slow it down kind of make a dilla beat out of it um then I would mix uh yeah because you played a lot of that with you know Johnny Hammond Right, right. Or some cool in the gang, summer madness in the background, or you know, you name it. Uh, Jamera Choir with Outcast. Right. Um, because that would fit in my format, and then that would keep the continent. They wouldn't compromise the integrity of my, you know, what I do. Or they wouldn't even say, "Well, you didn't." They couldn't say you didn't play it. You yeah, play it. it's being played. So. <laughs> So the thing is, I was already connected to people that did media base. Right, right. So because I already, like, I'm already connected behind the scene. So since I'm, I already know the game. So this is the whole thing with me. It's like, I don't do it for money. I just figure out how the game is working. And I look at the game board from a bird's eye view. And then I make the appropriate, you know, uh, movements. Right. Pieces. That's how I always did my life. I did that in the military. I went in the military to get certain things out of it, and then I got out. Right. When I moved to Atlanta, I, I came here to get what I want out of it, and I'm still here. I, I love Atlanta, honestly. It's a great place. Right. Um, what the future entails, I, I don't know that. I, you know, is, I, that a, is that a basement, by the way, that you're in? This is actually the third floor of a condo. Well, okay, but I was about to say because I I miss my basement in Kansas City, and anytime I see somebody sitting in the basement, I'm gonna feel some kind of way about it. Shout out to all my people that love them basements, bro. Shout out to you. Uh,
You still there? You freezing up here? Um, it's completely awesome that we have the infamous DJ Jamad affiliated. The, 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 the canon, the canon, um, you know, and like I said, I think you created your own Wayne. Um, in a lot of ways, um, there might have been an argument saying, well, how would I have known you? Like, how would I have known what you did, me being from Orlando and, 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 and you know, living in Kansas City? And I'm saying, like, damn, um, I'm looking back at it, man. And like I said, you gave me hope into DJing. Um, you made me feel like I felt like when I was like 15 or 14 and I got my first, I think I was 13, when I got my first tape from 98.7 Kiss FM from Red Alert. And and I remember what that did to me, what how it changed me as as a listener of music like to your point like to your earlier points um yes i got to hear him dj the drops were a part of the show the certain remixes were a part of the show the promos that he played were you know yeah jungle brothers doing promo or the tribe called quest doing a promo and those things were a part of the show when i heard your show I was able to feel and hear that in your show. It sounded, it sounded like it was. It's satellite radio. Like this, this got to be coming from like Venus or Mars or somewhere because, you know, for a while we went through a lull where people weren't playing that kind of music. It was just, you know, all the commercial stuff, which was good, you know, for what that was, but. Like I said, too much of anything, man. I just don't think that's good for anyone. Well, uh, you know, the main thing I, I like to give credit to is I'm just a vessel. I give credit to everyone that I come in contact with. Where Shout out I, to Drew. Drew said he's pointless to resist. Yes, that was the drop that you used. It's pointless. It was all right. If I listen to this, we... Benji B is going to have a playlist or, or um, uh, Giles Peterson. If they have two songs on their show, I'm going to take two songs. So I'm going to take the songs I hear on somebody else's show. And then I'm going to put it on my, on my, I'm going to put it in my playlist. If I talk to someone like DJ Rod do in Alabama and he's telling me what he likes to hear, he's going to tell me, Hey, you should check out this album. If I go to the record store, I'm gonna either meet someone in there and they're gonna tell me about something. Um, the list goes on and on and on. It's not necessarily me, it's because I'm just resourceful. I dig and I look for stuff. So basically that's all it really is. Um, but there's a courage in that, and I don't want I don't want I don't want this to be glossed over. And I, you know what? I can't, you know, it's like, it's not really me getting all the credit. The thing that I, I would take the credit for is how I put it together. I have to put it together in a way where it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to mix this Transformers. Uh, I'm going to do this mixtape with Transformers because I'm inspired by it. It's because I like Transformers. You know what I mean? I go watch the movie and then these things will come to me. But it's always someone else that where I might have heard a song or I've discovered it, whether it's a record store, uh, like Moods Music in Atlanta, they're still around. That's, that's probably one of the only record stores left in Atlanta. It still has vinyl, CDs, um, Wax and Facts. I used to go to this guy, William, over there. This guy's a phenomenal DJ. He used to DJ in a record uh, roller skating rink. This guy was. Super on point, one of the best DJs. I'm like, man, this guy, his blends are super perfect. Right. Um, intricate, they just detailed, long blends, like flawless. Uh, you got Cha Cha Jones, Jamal Ahmed on 91.9. I listen to them. I get pick up songs from his show on the weekend, Universal Love. Then you go and I hear Kemet play songs, Salah or Kai. They play house music. They swap records. Ron Pullman, they swap records with me. Um, 
there's so many people that I get resources and and that helps to build an entire uh, you know uh, body of work here where it's like hey I got this mixtape but about 20 people were involved in this one mix right and and, and yes they deserve credit yeah, yeah. let me tell you something like I tell all my DJs that come on my show there's a courage that's still required for you to open your mouth yeah right yeah. The, the record is your mouth. You know, I mean, the turntable is your mouth. Like, you being able to play that, there has to be a decision made. Should I play this? And you're saying yes. In a world in which sometimes comfort is their own hell, right? Like, they're so comfortable listening to the same shit. When you present them new shit, they look at you like you're crazy. Like, you're, you're literally, as a DJ, you're an inventor. You're, you know... The DJs that I think as DJing, not just, not the wedding DJ, not the request DJ, not the jukebox DJ, because your DJing is solely based on someone else telling you what to play. And there's very little skill to that other than you knowing how to use the equipment. Yeah. But a DJ is a painter of music. He, he literally starts off with this blank canvas, and he's taking risk. You're seeing the picture with maybe a couple of frames in it. You don't, you Until he's done, when the picture is fully complete, that's when you can do a judgment. Mm -hmm. But we live in a day and age where as you're making this painting, you already have the vision of the painting. And that requires a certain amount of courage, a certain amount of deliberateness, mm -hmm. a certain amount of, of like purpose that you're doing this regardless to what the wave is, who agrees with it or not, while you're making it. And for those, and I'm talking about the Kick Capris, I'm talking about the Jamans, I'm talking about, you know, uh, Jazzy Jeff, Jazzy Jeff. The Jazzy Jeffs, the people that, Say, okay, I'm playing this, and you just gonna have to accept that. Yeah, and when I'm done, y'all can judge me then. But right you know, right I, I want to give a big shout out to Soul Fusion. Yeah, that was a very good period for me because that was a great party that infused it, gave an opportunity for me to play the music I wanted to play, but it also, uh, it, it, it allowed us to have uh, this uh, diverse and uh, unlimited amount of expression for us to be able to play the type of music we, you know, we wanted to. And that did cultivate a certain type of uh, community in Atlanta. Right. For, for me to get, you know, because I used to give away my mixtapes at that party. Um, and then and then after that was I was working with Justin Huff which he was basically the one that did a lot of uh, the photography and designs over like, I'd say like a, a four year period yeah. where it really kind of like really just took my stuff to the next level. So I want to give a big shout out to Jay Carter, J Justin Huff, and of course, W, uh, all the artists that work on my uh, projects, uh, K uh, occasional superstar, Fabian Williams, um, Flux, uh, Goldie Gold, uh, H2O, and also my son. My son even learned how to do graphics. And of course, now I have my wife, Takia Loves You. Takia is her name. She actually does graphics and does stuff now. So yeah, it's it's really been definitely a, a, a really interesting journey about, because it all had to do with my choice. And you're saying the courage that this is very true is because really, and in a lot of ways, still, I'm alone because people don't know what I'm doing now. I'm doing things that's still different. You know, I'm still like kind of like a, a a lone soldier in the stuff that I do is because I'm not I'm just not a follower. I just don't like to follow the crowd. But I respect I respect uh, what everybody what choices people make. You know, what's your uh, what's your sign? I'm a cancer cancer. Um, and that says a lot yeah. because 
you guys could be very emotional and kind of all over the place. But that's but also Gemini. 13 signs is going to make me a Gemini. Uh, uh, 12 signs make me a Cancer. And, and, but the idea of everything that I hear you saying, I think is very, very important for anyone who is entering the market um, or trying to destroy any barriers to the entry of market um, in this thing we call, in this thing of ours that we call hip hop, uh, because it requires that, that level, that level of courage to, to make those kind of decisions. Um, I, the hardest thing in life isn't the process of doing something. It's the actual choosing to do it, which That's is right. Right. the most difficult part for anyone. Anyone can say they can do Be something. Yourself. Being yourself yeah. is such an important thing is because right. what, what I was able to do is like, hey, I want to play um, – I want to play, say, like uh, Jafari or these West Coast underground records. Right. And I want to mix these records with Erica Baudu or Maxwell, whatever is hot at the moment. So you just find things that have the same similar sound and you're able to play those things. And what it does, it, it creates, uh, it reverberates, you know, basically into the, you know, into the you're broadcasting basically what people don't realize hey. you're broadcasting dude who you are again. yeah you're broadcasting who you are into who the, you are yeah as I, a radio yeah, yeah as a radio you, basically you're basically gonna you're gonna basically uh affect those that can feel that same frequency that you're on right. and I think and I bro once Black History came around, bro, Black History Month, I was like, dude, I got to have him on my show. Um, simply because, like I said, I know what what you did in, in altering my trajectory. Um, because when I heard you is when I needed to hear you. Um, it was like a hopeful, like, man, okay, yeah. That is what we supposed to be doing. You know, it was a confirmation, um, you know, because a DJ, they face a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not all DJs are the same. And shout, uh, uh, and shout out to all my DJs out there. Um, shout out to my DJs that DJ for weddings. Um, that, you know, DJ by... DJ by data, DJ data. They just have the data um, and, and, the, and the knowledge to run the equipment. They're, they're not into expression via DJing that way. They're in it for supplying a service simply to make others, other people happy. Mm -hmm. And shout out to them. Mm -hmm. um, there's also DJs that are there to, you know, reinvent how we look at the equipment. Oh, you could do that. You could do that. Shout out to them. And then there's the other DJs who use that as a canvas um, to create these paintings that either you had to be there, you had to record it, or you have to have a copy of it to know what that, what that moment in time, and it's a moment in time, the mix, if he took the same records, there's, it's not a routine, to your point, freestyling. It's not a routine. This can never be redone again. It will sound different every single time afterwards. So you know you know really where Aframento is like, uh, the birth of the mix really has a lot to do with multi-tracking. It's because right. when I try to do my mixes, so I was cool with uh, DJ Thorough, right? Uh, me and him would DJ, and we would do mixes. And it always seemed like the mix is going fine. You do 45 minutes on one side. It's always at one part you get you mess up, and it throws off because you know you're being recorded. Right. The moment you mess up, it's just like, you're like, oh, I messed up. 
you take it to heart and then you just don't want to mix no more. So <laughs> I started getting no, no, my DJs that know some about that. Yes, go. So, so I would do the whole mix, really, it sounded great. But then there's that one part. I want it to be flawless. And that's why I only have so many on cassette, on cassette tape. Right. So when I started doing multi-tracking, I didn't ha- I wasn't pressured to do the mix in 45 minutes straight through. Then I got to learn more of the music by me always having to, you know, press play, rewind, press play, rewind, press play. So when you're doing that, your ideas are kind of more, uh, you're more intentional in how you're doing stuff versus when you're doing things in real time, you're limited. So if you miss it, that record skips while you're going back and forth, you're backspinning and then record skip, you just, it's like, man, that was before the internet when you're doing all this copy and paste, cut and paste and stuff like that, you know? So well, a lot of the magic does come from the, uh, I feel like, and this is just my personal opinion. I feel there's a time and a space for everything, right? If you're DJing at a radio station, like you're physically there, mm-hmm. everything has to be done according to plan. I think that has a space for it. Yeah. I think if you're in direct, you're you're a director, a producer of a show, then the show needs to be fully produced, mm-hmm. and it needs to have segments. It yeah. needs to have um, this this flow to it that sometimes can't always be done on the turntables. But yeah. that's what a producer is. Like, you know, a DJ now elevates to the role of DJ slash producer. And I I think those things are are, are well and good as well. Like, I've I've created a formula with my own way of doing things where um, I was talking to my man, Ricky Rick. Shout out to Ricky Rick. Um, He he was like, yo, you need to listen to that new Karis One album. And I had to tell him, I'm like, dude, I don't listen to albums like that no more. And it's crazy because I, I couldn't wait till the next KRS One album came out. But I don't want like if when I'm about to do a show, I want to hear those records right then and there for the first time and figure it out as I go. And and that for me is like a world premiere for me, given all the music I've ever heard in my life. I like it to be fresh. For me, and that way it keeps my skills where it needs to be. Like I need to be prepared if I heard it or didn't hear it. But you know, like I, I do that regiment so that I can still be in love with the idea. Like that's my way of being in love with it. I need to hear it for the first time when I actually play it, so that I'm not so much focused on recording the show, but that I'm actually enjoying hearing it for the first time when I'm playing it. Yeah, and, uh, I, think, I think that's where the turntable is. When I used to watch the DMC videos, I used to study those a lot. But then I would hear like JC, um, or I would hear like uh, when I go to the DMC battles, uh, you got uh, DJ um, um, DJ Lord, DJ Clever, you know, cats like that that are skilled, highly skilled. Right in turntablism and you're able to see them do that live it's like wow i can't do that so that's why when i started getting into the multi-tracking I right like, my means to be kind of like hey this is my style being like an executioner you right know, or, or rock raider or or Ralph smith or dj eclipse right the track machine because then i can manipulate and make it sound a certain way right express that in, in, in you know it's for the culture you know aspect of where right and it's a production it's a scratch. yeah like the dj premiere when he's scratching in the songs right it's All a production it is a it's that's to me that's what hip-hop is it's, yeah it's, it's incorporating different elements where it's not just to be it's like the dj is actually doing scratches here and there or or you have uh you know that's why i had to include the artwork so i had to touch on all the principles you know of hip-hop per se and i think you did a great job like i said 
Um, there's a lot of people that you've touched that you're probably going to spend the rest of your life meeting that you didn't think you reached them. Um, I think you're, you're going, you know, what you've done, that little bit of courage it took for you to do what you did and, and like I said, stand out amongst the trees and do you. Um, you don't realize how important that is how what that does to inspire to grow other people around you it doesn't always translate into green dollars but they're lifetime dollars that you accrued um and you know and there's you know this show like i told you when we talked on the phone is about recognizing the people that have made the contribution that you know, I ha I can say you're a part of my story. Like I can't tell my story without telling yours because you're a part of my story. So I wanted everyone to know this part of my story. And even though they might've known you or even though they didn't know you, I, it's only fair that if I'm telling the story of Orlando, the story of, of, of where I'm coming from, you know, what that, what your portion did for my life. It inspired me, gave me hope, put me on. Um, you were playing Mad Lib before anybody, you know, it felt like, you know, you were putting a lot of, a lot of people on the, you know, the producers you mentioned, um, you know, at that time, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the producer for Common, uh, what, what you no, say? Idea. No, no idea. idea. Yeah, like no ID pre Def Jam president. Like, yeah. you know, you were putting a lot of people that at that moment were not getting light. They weren't even seeing the light of day in a lot of instances. Um, There's a lot of stuff like, you know, Mantronics is probably one of my favorites. Right. Oh, all the time, bro. So, so Mantronics, um, anything that had to do with like uh, loop sample based hip hop beats, uh, yeah. like Kenny Dope. Uh, you Murphy got seventy three. Murphy um, seventy three. Yeah, any any anything that was really kind of like uh, pushing the boundaries of right. innovation. That's why Jay Dilla was so important uh, is because of his approach to sampling, you know? Right, right. Um, and now you got like uh, producers like Kay Trinata, uh, yeah, that are continuing, you know, to innovate and evolve the culture. Um, right. The main thing is what, what it was me, it, it always had to be the balance of, of family is because I wanted things to be pleasing to my family. You know, right. my mother, my aunt, <laughs> you know, my uncle had Sirius XM. You know, he's a he's a stand-up guy. He's a straight guy. You know, he's classy dude. And it's like, hey, right. if my uncle's listening to this, I can't be cursing and talking crazy and acting like a fool. I can't be embarrassing my family. So the main thing is what is this has gotta be I got hey, I still honor my my mother and father, you know what I mean? My grandfather, my grand, you know, my, my grandmother and grandfather. And my children, you know, their mothers, uh, you know, even today, it's like, you know, I make sure that I just don't want to, uh, I'm all about bringing the family together, uniting people, bringing family together. Right. You don't want to be known for destroying the community. So that's the thing with me. Right. Right. That, just be honest, bro. That's yeah. exactly what it is. I can't you destroy it because if I destroy, like with the music that's just done for money, it's all about money, money, money. Now the value system's out the door. Now there's no boundaries. N n next thing you know, I'm gonna be 80 years old. Somebody come hit me in the head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I don't want that to come back on me. I don't want that to fall back on me. Is because hey, I didn't do my part. So with mentoring, I helped the other DJs to come through. Like you don't have to do that way. You can be yourself. Like Julian Virgin. He's one of my earlier mentees that I heard his show on uh, 88.5 Georgia State. 
And I just taught him the technical aspects of DJ and, and he's really taken off. He's doing weddings. Um, he's doing really good for himself with journalism and stuff like that. Um, there's other people like uh, DJs in the work crew, Jeremy Avalon. He's an outstanding DJ as well that grew up listening to my mixes. Uh, big shout going out to the DJ uh, to Bone with Raw Soul. He's a great friend of mine. That me and him still work together over the years. Um, I just want to thank everyone that has been contributed to my success overall to these years. Right. And for me to have this kind of longevity, you know, I've been DJing for what, 30 plus years, man. And for me to still be able to do something I'd love to do, uh, it, you know, I have the highest amount of appreciating gratitude for everyone, each and every person that, like today, I just met a guy, a, a great artist today. Um, he followed me on Instagram and he might be interested in me doing a mix for him. You know, I said, hey, just give me a playlist of what you like. I'll mix it for you so you could be inspired to do your artwork. So the opportunities are endless. Abundance is endless if you put yourself in a position to just serve other people. Um, like I said, I DJ for free at Carnival in Buckhead. And that just continually gives me opportunities to this day. And big shout going out to Jewel. Jewel Prevo. Pre, Pre, Prevo. I love Jewel is because Jewel is probably one of my biggest supporters in Atlanta right now. You know, that's amazing. She, any shirt we come out with, any sweat hoodie and jewelry, she is like, uh, man, she's a disciple, man. A DJ Jamai Aframental's disciple. She, she basically has put me out there spreading the word. And she's not only doing that for me, she's doing that for other artists like uh, DJ Kerosene, um, Goldie Gold, um, you name it. Uh, Mark, there's a guy that uh, in, in our group, we have this group called Afro Kinfo. Um, uh, DJ Mark, this guy is up and coming with on the soul tip. This dude's selection is impeccable, man. And He's a young guy. I haven't met him yet personally, but on social media, we socialize, we commune, you know, it's, it's we commune. It's right. all community. It's coming into unity. Just like with me and you. Now I feel like I have an extension down in Orlando. You already know, bro. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate how you inspired me in a time where I was in a transition. I had your mixes to kind of uh, give me a grounding and centering uh, to my childhood, which who would have thought you knew about my childhood through music? What, what, uh, oh, you don't mind me, what's your age? Oh yeah, uh, 47, I'm 47, man. 47, okay, so I'm 51. Yeah, yeah, but you're right there. We 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 are, we are damn near out the same class. Um, and my appreciation for music, um, like I said, being a DJ all my life, uh, I'm not only a practice, a, a doctor, right? Yeah. But I, 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 you know, to me, I'm, I'm also a fan of other doctors, and I know, I know everybody's plight is different. I know that when we're talking about um, the understanding of what it takes to have courage through music. Not, every, not all money is good money. You 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 want to tell your story. Um, you want to be able to to look your your kids in the eye and be like, yeah, um, I get what you I get what they doing, but that ain't me. Mm -hmm. um, I had that similar spaces in my life where I had to tell people, hey, I get you, but that ain't what I'm trying to represent because I got to look my kids in the face and they know how I get down already. And I'm not switching up on them yeah. for you, you know. And and so those spaces in life, you you, they're a minority of people. They're not the majority, um, because a majority of people, kind of don't want to make that decision. Mm -hmm. 
They they kind of move among the the the, the surroundings kind of indifferent, mm -hmm. you know, um, this is why they pay managers and bosses those big bucks because they're paid to make decisions that mm -hmm. other people are unwilling to make. Mm -hmm. And, and DJs are the boss of music. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to decide on what record collections we are going to buy or put the effort in cataloging and, and going through the painstaking view of making crates and organizing it and 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 weeding out the fat you know and all of this stuff and to do all of that you have to make decisions you you can't you can't be someone that is completely you know inert in making a decision um and i think you know everything that you described was a part of that decision making and it should inspire any other DJ out here listening right now that it's okay to not necessarily always net the money. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's okay to net the dignity. It's good to have maybe a balance. It's okay. Yeah, it's good to have a balance between the two. Big shout out going out to, to Dr. McCowan, Kevin McCowan. Uh, he's been a big supporter. He, he claims to be my number one fan, Dr. McCowan. Kevin, what's up, Kevin? <laughs> Steve Miller. So Steve Miller is in Ohio. Uh, Kevin is here. He went to Morehouse. So uh, those are my two biggest supporters with Jewel and also um, Medelta. Uh, but well, anytime we can get you down here to rock in the I'm city, all in, beautiful. I'm all, I'm all in, man. I'm all in. I would definitely love to do something um, creative where we can collab. Uh, in the meantime, if you're if you're open to doing a mix together, yeah, man, of great. course, bro. I'll be you honest. Can even yeah. do a set if you want to do Operation Hot Combs. You can do the Operation Hot Combs, and we can do a live feed from 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 where you're at. And we hey, man, that sounds interesting. Man. I love to do like I know about that Hot Combs. Yeah, like, I, I, that shit is dope. So like, oh, yeah, I would love it because then I would love to hear what you know what what kind of creativity you got. I just had DJ Rumble on. Uh, he's at, lives in my neighborhood. I didn't even right. know I DJ. So one day I was talking to him. He's like, "Yeah, man. Hey, I, I've been watching you on Instagram. I DJ." I like you DJ. I like you know this guy is a, a bicyclist. He, he's a mechanic. He works on BMWs. Next wow. thing you know, DJ. I'm like, "Wow, man. What else do you do?" I'm like he came over, man. Did a great set last Thursday. So yeah, That's man. Cool. I love, love to return the favor, man, of what you're doing uh, now. And why not, man? Get you to do Operation Hot Combs or Afromentals. And uh, everything you've been inspired by, you can just do your thing. And that way I can also experience, because that's what I actually like. I actually like to watch other people and also be inspired, especially, hey, man, these people are inspired by me, but I'm inspired by you. Right, right. That's Absolutely. doing this thing. Yeah, it's a it's reciprocity happening. Well, I'm definitely going to send you, I'm definitely going to send you the radio show as soon as we get off uh, to give you an idea of what I'm, I'm throwing at these people in Orlando because to me, like this is my city. I feel like they deserve to hear um, the eclectic, the eclectic face of hip hop in its most honest direction. So I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to send that up to you. And um, you know, um, I want to tell you thank you for joining us tonight, Black History Month, there you are. Um, and being a part of that. Um, and and just like I said, uh, for doing what you do, um, there's no age to it, man. Continue to do what it is you do because the world needs that. I need that. So, uh, yeah, just continue doing what you're doing, man. Thank and you for the confirmation, Rowan. I appreciate it. I want to give a big shout out going out to all the photographers. Rodney, Justin Huff, Kat uh, Gaduko. Um, um, anyone that's been contributed, if I, you know, if I left you out, all the artists that I've worked with over the years, all the music artists, of course, Takia, you know, I appreciate all your support you've given me. Um, you can visit uh, www.afromentals.com. We have merch. Of course, we got brand new shirts for Black History Month on the site that you can purchase. 
And um, everyone that's following me, you can catch me at uh, Jamad710. That's my DJ page. And Afro Mentals is my, my lifestyle page. So and hey. you can to my Mixcloud. My Mixcloud link is in the bio. DJ Jamad, Afro Mentals. You just Google that and you'll find me. Appreciate it. Uh, my brother get, sent me uh, some mixes. Um, and I will be playing some of those mixes on this Friday night on 98.5, The Wire. I'm looking forward to doing that. I don't feature a lot of DJs on there, uh, but I, dude, I had, I got to bring you on that night. So, uh, appreciate yeah, it. yeah, appreciate like, that, that's, that's a special night for DJs. Uh, step yeah. your game up, man. This brother is just, <laughs> He's just got his own flavor, man, and I'm I'm honored and privileged to be able to run him on uh on Friday night. So once again, man. Hey, do it for the culture, man. Do it for the people, man. Yes. This, this is my shield all day. <laughs> yes. Give it up for Mr. For Afro Meadows. All right. DJ Jamad. <laughs> Give it up. Thank you for joining the soul show, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, man, you know how the soul show gets down. Love y'all, man. All my late bloomers that are continuing to tune in. We love you. Thank you. Um, the show ain't for everybody. I, I know that. Uh, we're talking about real humanity. Um, we're not objectifying our people. We want to hear what they're really coming from. And um, this is what the show is about. And it's coming from my city. The city beautiful, the sound of Orlando. You already know. Shout out to everybody on the check in. You know, shout out to Jewel. Shout out to my man Jesse Jazz, the legend. Shout out to my man Ricky. You know, um, the show is for y'all, man. I, I I do this for y'all. I'm very honored that I can talk with people about real things and this thing of ours, which is hip hop. So kudos to y'all. Tomorrow I will have DJ Tat Money representing Philly coming through on the Sound of Orlando show. You already know I'm, I'm about my DJs, and I can't wait to have this brother on tomorrow night. So shout out to that. And thank you for joining us tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. Let's go. Live on stage, the sound. Oh, Orlando! So, is they ready? Yes. The sound. Oh, Orlando!